I'll try to stay awake after a long night of preparation for this conference and hopefully after a long day of very excellent speakers uh, you can do the same but uh, I, I think that this talk will dovetail in quite well to that of Deb Nelson uh, talking about the need for better tracking of MRSA and the need to be able to judge its true incidence. Currently you can find five different sources, three of which are ongoing tracking systems to try to judge what the incidence of MRSA is. Uh, the first and probably best known right now is the National Healthcare Safety Network or NHSN. This is run by the CDC. Uh, hospitals which participate in it are in Medicare's pro prospective payment system and there's approximately 1,800 to 2,000 hospitals which have MRSA data which can be found online. That's out of approximately 5,000 hospitals. They, uh, this system tracks bloodstream infections. The next is the Emerging Infection Program. Uh, this comprises nine metropolitan areas. Uh, the CDC uses this extensively for uh, developing uh, estimates on diseases which are um, uh, or on in the incidence of diseases which are then extrapolated nationwide. Uh, the Emerging, Inf Emerging Infection Program uses uh, MRSA infections and the uh, reports uh, specify this as being invasive infections. And this is, uh, as I'll discuss a little bit later, kind of uh, confusing because I always had as a definition of infection being invasive, but uh, they mean something different. Finally, uh, the University Healthcare Consortium uh, has billing records which they have gone through and reviewed to give an idea of the incidence of MRSA. Uh, hospital onset and community onset can be judged by the time of diagnosis. There is a problem though on, on the billing data with this is that the bills are oftentimes submitted before the cultures get back of a person who's hospitalized and so that the hospital onset infections they estimated could be underreported by as much as 25%. Uh, the, the next surveillance system is called the Surveillance Network. This is approximately 300 outpatient laboratories. Uh, this is a voluntary network. The CDDEP uh, tends to run this. They get an estimation of community versus hospital uh, MRSA based upon MRSA uh, serotypes that uh, are evaluated by the lab. And finally, uh, there'll be reports out from the U.S. Military and Veterans Affairs Healthcare Systems. Uh, the VA has um, approximately 120 hospitals and facilities in its network. It's a very large um, system and, and although it's not really a, a reporting network uh, as one would e usually think of it, but they have good geographical distribution and uh, they um, publish their data periodically so it is available in the literature. However, when you look at all these tracking systems, uh, they there's different subject populations that they follow. You're talking about military, general population. Sometimes there's pediatric reports, uh, restricted geographic areas. They have different definitions of what their HAIs are that they're counting, whether it's uh, all MRSA infections, such as the VA system, invasive MRSA, uh, EIP, bloodstream infections, NHSN. And of course, there's laboratory cultures, which is actually a surrogate. In other words, you're really want is infections, but culture is a positive culture, is related to infections, but it is an infection. It, it's, it's a culture, it's not an infection, so that's called a surrogate metric or measure. And you'll find varying terminology, some of which is very confusing, like community onset healthcare associated. Um, and to me, I, I, I found that term to just be mind-boggling when I would try to read the article. I'd come to that and I'd always have to stop and think what it meant. So it, it is difficult to do research in this area. Now when you talk about invasive MRSA when that's reported, I, I would think that this slide of this necrotic hand could be defined as you know invasive and would be reported at least to the NHSN, but it could possibly defined as primarily a soft tissue and skin infection and may not have septicemia or a a positive blood culture, so it may not be reportable, yet it is a severe infection. So that points out that we do not have a comprehensive reporting system. So our group uh, last year downloaded all the uh, data that we could from the NHSN, this is primarily bloodstream infections, and looked at incidents. 
And compared to 2010, 2011 baseline, there was a slight drop, about 11%. And then all of a sudden, it went to baseline back up in 2015. In one data set, it actually went above baseline, but you know, we were told by uh, the CDC that we should probably use the other data set because it was uh, uh, more accurate. But it still showed an increase. And on reflection of this, why it is going up, the CDC did some research and felt it was due to changes in definitions of how the community uh, MRSA was, was being reported. Now, um, I should note here that regardless of whether or not there's an increase, we're nowhere near achieving the 2020 goal of a 50% decrease. We're nowhere near on track in two and a half years now to see a 50% reduction. And, and here's the raw data. So basically, the, the reason for the increase, uh, we were under the understanding that this was due to an aberration in the methodology of how to contract community acquired infections, and that the EIP data, the other tracking system, did not show an increase. And again, we can at least, uh, uh, everybody was in agreement, we're not controlling this well enough. Okay, but wait. I didn't misspeak when I said community associated or community MRSA, is that hospital MRSA rates are adjusted by the community MRSA rate. Now, I can tell you a lot of advocates do not like that. Uh, hospitals feel that that's risk adjustment. On the other hand, we feel that if there's a high rate of MRSA in the community, well, then maybe you need to start admission screening of MRSA and, and get this lowered. We don't want to see hospital rates lowered so people think there's not an MRSA problem when indeed there may well be an MRSA problem because of high rates in the community. Uh, this, you know, there's, there's two areas here. One is uh, hospital performance, but the other is just risk to the patient. I mean, if you're going to have a sterile operation or implant, you don't want to go into a facility that has a constant high rate of MRSA, even if that's due to the community. Uh, you know, maybe you should go to a facility that does not have that problem. The other is uh, the MRS, the EIP data, which didn't show an increase. When, when I looked at that data, uh, and I, I did this in consultation, it looked like to me the line was still ticking upward. Uh, but then we were told it wasn't a significant increase. Um, but then we also noted that there was only six out of nine labs that were used to report the data, and I'm not sure how those six labs were uh, uh, selected. So I, I really think that the United States isn't performing well enough at this point on controlling MRSA. Uh, but I don't have good data to tell you that. And that in itself is, is a problem and was the main thrust of this paper is that we need to get better data. Now, uh, 2016 uh, is of course out, but that data has been, I, I believe, readjusted with a new baseline, et cetera, and so that makes it where you have to do additional adjustments for comparison. So I think that you have to go 2016 forward would be a safer way of tracking it. So again, we're nowhere near on track. So why is this needed? Well, unfortunately, as you've heard from Deborah Nelson, is that much of the research regarding MRSA has been tainted with significant research integrity problems. And this has clouded policy formation. And there was a saying that I saw in one of the articles, and that's bad data, bad policy, dead patients. And we want to try to avoid that. So much similar to the FDA doing post-market follow-up and studies, we need to make sure we do this with a tracking system to do post-protocol implementation follow-up studies, and which means we need to have a good tracking system. For example, trying to compare the efficacy of chlorohexidine bathing versus surveillance and isolation. Well, surveillance and isolation is used to control MRSA by the VA. They have excellent results. Uh, chlorohexidine bathing, it was reported, is in a, a large number of hospitals now in the United States to control MRSA. I'm not quite sure what those uh, results are, as we'll get into that a little bit uh, later, but you can't directly compare those two data sets because they measure two different things. They don't share the same baseline, so you really don't know. You can suspect, you know, 70 plus percent decrease with the VA system is, is excellent decrease. That's going to be a hard number to beat. Uh, chlorhexidine bathing uh, also had a very good, or had a very good results reported in a study, but again, we have questions about some of the integrity in the research. So some of the integrity concerns with chlorhexidine 
uh, research, and I'm just going to kind of summarize this. Recently, there was a report from the World Health Organization on ana surgical antiseptics, and they uh, concluded that uh, chlorhexidine plus alcohol was, uh, uh, the study supported that as a method of choice. However, when you analyze their meta-analysis, you found that they changed their data inclusion window or their study inclusion window uh, during the course of the study and that uh, that allowed entrance of a large positive study but a large negative study during that same extended period wasn't included and there were uh, two studies in which the concentration of alcohol is not known in the past sometimes the alcohol concentration uh, that uh, is in the iodine uh, isn't enough to have a true bactericidal effect and that has has occurred so that knowing the actual concentration of the antiseptics used should be a prerequisite to uh, publishing a paper. There's a number of studies that looked at two antiseptics versus one. This is very uh, common, unfortunately, uh, looking at chlorhexidine plus alcohol, comparing it just to iodine, it's two versus one comparison. And when you read these papers, you get the impression that the alcohol is kind of like the water additive. It's inert. When in fact, alcohol is probably the most powerful antiseptic of the three. It doesn't last a long time. That's the big advantage of chlorhexidine. It lasts a long time. But as far as immediate onset of action and, and kill, alcohol is probably the most common. So doing a two versus one comparison is not, uh, is not appropriate. And in some of these studies, they would conclude that chlorhexidine was the product that was more efficacious. Not chlorhexidine plus alcohol, but chlorhexidine. It would mention that sometimes in the conclusion section or in the abstract section, and you'd actually have to read the method section to find out what the study did. Uh, the Charles Denham affair was mentioned where it was being recommended a particular form formulation of chlorhexidine uh, to be used when there wasn't uh, well, when many people felt there wasn't adequate um, studies to support that, and in the surgery uh, case of antisepsis, the recommendation that finally came out of NQF was to just use alcohol plus another antiseptic. They did not uh, stress chlorhexidine. For central lines, there you do need a delayed action. Uh, chlorhexidine is still recommended, but the concentration was not specified being, you know, exactly 2%, which was the uh, care fusion formulation. And finally, daily chlorhexidine bathing is another study which was published, and, and I feel that this was basic, was popularized the most by the reduced MRSA study. And uh, after this study, ARC, using the same research group, uh, published uh, How I Do It with Chlorhexidine Bathing. Uh, that study had a, a parent spinning of data where there was a lot of confusion between this kind of this comprehensive catch-all group called any pathogens, uh, where in the abstract it said it was effective against any pathogens, but in reality that was a catch-all group that was mainly yeast and staph epi, which is a benign bacteria. Uh, that metric was added after trial completion, and they also used as, a, as a, a surrogate metric for their primary outcome, and, and MRSA cultures were significantly decreased, but again, that's a surrogate metric. Uh, there was not a significant decrease due to, due to MRSA bloodstream infections, and uh, some people have said, well, that's because the study, you know, had just had low numbers. It didn't bring it out. There was a, a small tendency towards reduction, but it wasn't significant. Of course, the other reason could be it's not significant, and it was not a small study. It was all HCA hospitals. It was a large study. So uh, all of this gives a lot of hesitation uh, to chlorhexidine being used as a primary product. And I, I can remember when I was in surgery when all of a sudden you weren't prepping with iodine, but you were prepping with uh, chlor chlorhexidine. And the biggest problem we had when you were a surgeon is, is that when you prep with chlorhexidine, it was clear you couldn't tell where you prepped. And so draping was a problem. And if you had to extend that excision and that plastic drape, you weren't 100% sure if you were going to extend it into an area that was still prepped. And that was one of the initial problems. And, and of course, I, I've, some people said there's some formulations now that'll have a dye to take care of that, but nevertheless, that was a, a problem initially. 
So I did so I did this talk in 15 minutes. So that is on time. And we have 10 minutes for questions.